Hello, everyone, and welcome to this conversation about how we will learn in the future, brought to you by Future Tense, a collaboration of New America, Slate Magazine, and Arizona State University. My name is Punya Mishra, and I'm Associate Dean for Scholarship and Innovation at the Mary Lou Fulton Teachers College at ASU. Uh, to start us off, I will briefly introduce our speakers, and then we'll jump right into our discussion on how we can learn in a technologically complicated future. And if you haven't already, I would encourage you to go and uh, read these stories in the Learning Futures uh, published in Future Tense Fiction on Slate. To give some context, as we know, education and learning is always about the future. And the future, by definition, is unpredictable. This is particularly true um, given the rapidly changing world that we live in, and education has been and will continue to be profoundly affected by changes in technology, in science, and forces like climate change, globalization. And as we look to the future, imagination is critical. We live through and with our technologies these days, and fiction can help us understand what it might be to live like humans in this future, meaning, identity, community, and the kinds of moral dilemmas that emerge are important for us to confront and think about, and stories in particular provide us with a unique space and opportunity to ask what if. So this set of three stories considers how learning may be shaped by new technologies, how individuals, institutions, systems confront the moral and ethical challenges involved. First up, we have Simon Brown. Simon is an Australian science fiction writer, originally trained as a journalist and worked for a range of Australian uh, government departments. He's a member of the Australian Skeptics and edited Skeptical, a handbook for, of pseudoscience and the paranormal. Uh, that I didn't know about you, uh, that about you, Simon, and that is another connection I think we have in terms of interests. Uh, he was also an editor of Argos, the Journal of the Canberra Skeptics. And the story we are discussing won the 2020 Sapiens Plurum Short Fiction Contest. Next with us, we have Lee Alexander. Lee is an award-winning writer working at the intersection of technology, culture, and narrative. She designs stories for video games, creates fiction about digital society, and experiments with narrative systems. She has worked in inter interactive entertainment and digital culture for a decade and won the 2019 award for best writing in a video game. She has been nominated for a range of awards and I won't go through the whole list. Uh, so it's awesome to have you here Lee with us. Thank you. And Harry. finally, Shiv Ram Das is a multi-award nominated author of speculative fiction, short stories and novels. His first novel, Dome Child, was India's first mainstream cyberpunk novel. His short fiction has appeared in Slate, Strange Horizons, Fireside Fiction, Podcast and other publications. He is a graduate of the Clarion West Writers Workshop he was previously a radio host, worked in journalism, advertising, and event management. And Shiv and I intersect over the fact that he went for two days to the undergraduate institution that I finally got my degree from. So he was smarter than me and, and escaped that system before it gobbled him up completely. Um, so welcome to you all, and it's so good to see you all again. Uh, let me start by giving each of you a few minutes uh, to tell us what your story was about for those who you know, may have read it a little while ago or may not know. Uh, without revealing too much, so no spoilers. Um, so Simon, I'm gonna start with you since you were the first uh, person who started the series. So Simon. You're muted, Simon. There you go. Um, my story is, uh, is about communication between two people, in this case, um, um, a hyena and a human. Um, and they're able to communicate with each other because of a new piece of technology called a protein microchip. Um, one of each is inserted in their brains, allowing them to communicate, um, I guess, so to speak, intellectual, intellectually. Uh, uh, and the story is about how they find common ground in, in communicating with each other using this new technology. Simon, um, on to you, Shiv. Oh, sorry, Lee, because you were the next in our series. Um, yeah, so my story is about um, trying to research a painting that may or may not be real. Um, it's also about a couple that is confined, you know, during a pandemic um, and using spatial memories and experiences of art and sound as sort of coping mechanisms, I guess, um, and the learning angle. Um, is sort of about data literacy as the protagonist tries to find the vocabulary to search for um, this half remembered uh, piece of artwork. Um, at, and at the same time, her, her partner deals with sort of the unique stressors of, of remote teaching 
uh, in, in the environment. So um, yeah, the story deals with that. Yeah, and I think there's a lot more to it than that. And hopefully we'll get into some of those as well. And finally, on to you, Shiv. So my story is essentially, it's set in a university. It's the story of a professor who was under the belief he was going to receive tenure for his position, but instead is told he has to be part of a teaching competition with an AI. And the winner of those, and the winner of the teaching competition is the one who gets the tenure. And it's the story of how that particularly bizarre competition plays out and it essentially deals with stuff like financial pressures on the educational system, budgets, and the issue with basically short-term personnel-based solutions for long-term systemic problems. Thank you. Uh, so I think that that I think is a great summary of one thing that connects all of these stories. So I'm going to kick off with one question, but I really, uh, you guys have read the stories. I see, I'm sure that you're seeing themes and connections across them. Um, so I'd love this for this to be sort of an open conversation rather than this sort of me throwing questions at you. But let's start off with one question. So one of the really interesting things about all three stories is how different they are, right? I mean, one is about human animal communication, another is, you know, two people stuck in a pandemic and, you know, and dealing with university housing authority and as well as uh, a range of other uh, challenges in communication and connection and, and, and you know, AI-based educational systems, right? Um, so what is common to all of these in some ways are this idea of this mediated relationships through technology, right? And that what we gain, what we lose through that process. Uh, maybe I'll start with uh, Lee with you um, because I think in, in, in terms of, if I look at the three stories in terms of emotional heft, I think your story has sort of really dives into that sort of the psychological and the emotional and the sociological sort of aspects of that. So maybe start off with you and then I'll go to Simon and then to Shiv. Um, thank you. So um, specifically your question is about the emotional landscape of the story. I'm sorry, can, can you? Yeah, no, I think the, the emotional landscape in the context of technology mediated. Yeah. Right. Yes. I mean, I think that's a theme that I think connects across all three stories. Yes. I, so for me, I, I guess a lot of the cyberpunk and the futurism that I grew up with um, is focused on, you know, um, the economic impact or the hardware impact and stuff like that. Um, and I think for me, you know, as, specifically like as a woman growing up alongside the internet, I was sort of looking for cultural stories of how um, emerging technologies influence self-expression. Um, and I think um, because we're living in this, now we sort of reached this mass adoption era in the internet, almost everybody has, you know, more people than ever have a digital persona, you know what I mean? And I think, uh, your your use of the word medium or mediated is, is really apt because we're all now sort of mediating our interactions through this layer and and that it isn't just a technology issue anymore it's a human issue and and um, that's what I kind of wanted to to show through my work um, you know how our self-concept can be disoriented by emerging technology um, and certainly things like how we learn and how we socialize thank you um, Shiv I'm sorry, I had said Simon. Simon, please. Um, I think one of the things that, that struck me reading all three stories is, is, is their essential humanity. Um, all three stories, I think, attest the importance of being as human as possible in a world where that humanity is being mediated by technology. Um, I think, too, it, it, it deals with how technology changes the human condition, but in three, different, three very different ways. Yeah. Shiv? Yeah, I think it's fascinating, in fact, listening to these responses about how these different stories come from similar places, but are yet seen differently by the writers. Like for me, the one thing that's in common across all these stories is the aspect of the human element that relates to how humans interact with each other with regard to systems. So if you're looking at them societally, each of these stories has a very strong undercurrent of pressure on the protagonist to deal with the situation in a certain way whether it is the father in Simon's story who's constantly like making fun of his sons being part in the experiment, whether it's the pressure on Lee's protagonist to fit in certain mores and ways of accepting and dealing with technology and conducting the search, whether it's Ahmed in my story who was pressurized into viewing the problem as an immediate face off between himself and the machine as opposed to a larger systemic issue. So I think these three stories all basically say the same thing in three really different ways. 
through different mediums in a sense, even though yeah. so does that make sense? Yeah, it does. And I think that that's what was fascinating about the series for me is like how different these three stories are. But I think this point shift that you raise about the systems and structures that are in place, whether it's project sentience, and you know the, what I love about each of the stories is this little telling details which um, speak to this larger setup within which we are working, which is almost invisible to us. And we talked a little bit about that Shiv in our webinar. So in its its project sentience, and there are these hints about, um, for instance, you know they have to look for grants that need some successes. So that means there is this greater infrastructure within which this work exists, um, or the university and the housing authority in Lee's story and all, it actually there's a range of other sort of organizations and structures which allow you to access information but at some level prevent you from do, getting it in the way that you'd like and of course uh, the faceless people literally in, in Shiv's story. So I'd love to get your thoughts like extending on that about and again maybe as authors how you construct this world you know where you write a little short story but there is a bigger universe around it and I think that to me is the is pushing people, you know, the, uh, the characters in different ways that they are actually being played by these larger forces that might be invisible to them. And any one of you wants to go first, please go ahead. So it's such a big question. <laughs> it, it's, it's a great question. Like, I think we should touch upon the concept of what a near future is really because like it's a slightly fraudulent term to me in a sense because when we talk about near future what we're actually really talking about is distant present because like most stories of near future are basically the present viewed through eyes and talk you know it's essentially the slippery slope story right like we're talking about what would happen in the future if we leave things as they are in the present and in the context of like systems i think which is a lot of the focus of what i did I think it's really important to remember that. So we're living in this era where everyone sort of is supposed to fit into part of a system and and fulfill like this functional role within a system. So we're almost sort of like automating ourselves within systems. So which is why I thought Simon saw you was very fascinating because like it's all about the search for sentience in other species, while in the real world we're constantly like sort of like downplaying the effect of sentience on ourselves as employees okay. and workers. So it was a fascinating juxtaposition for me to look at. I would love yeah. to hear Lee, your thoughts on what uh, this idea of, you know, people having to fulfill their role, because in your story, there are these elements of wanting to be, you know, something and then denied admission at the university and then trying to find a space where you can actually fulfill this role. But you, you know, I, I please. Yeah, uh, well, I really liked what Shiv said about looking at these concepts as systemic um, and as portrayals of ecosystems. Um, and I guess, like, when we talk about what's the impact of a system, I think there are a lot of ways in which we ca it can't be better observed than in intimate life. Um, and so I think what you were seeing, you know, what, what I wanted to do by setting a story in a capsule like that is... Um, to kind of focus on how you know how those systems impact individual life you know i i I was relating to like a lot of young people who, for whom the system is breaking right underneath them as they come into adulthood. And, you know, the, mm -hmm. uh, the opportunities that our parents had, especially that their parents had are, are not there anymore. And, and um, yeah, this, this sense of, um, you know, how can you even set a trajectory in a system that is constantly in flux? I do think, you know, I misunderstood mm -hmm. the question originally, but I do think that's a, that's a question that is asked in all three of the pieces. Uh, you know, how do you self-orient if the ecosystem is in flux? And, and this is a near future problem, I think, as, as Shiv points out, um, you know, if futurism becomes more presentism, um, the more we think of it as a story of systems maturing and then declining, and then the individual struggling to orient therein. Thank you. Uh, Simon, any thoughts on that? I was just going to say, I remember in an earlier conversation with Shiv, Shiv mentioned that science fiction is often about the present, but also about the present moving. And it's in motion, and, and science fiction is a great way to get us, I get, I get us reviewing it, almost viewing it like a, like a vector of some kind. It's got, it's got direction and momentum. And science fiction allows us to step outside of that vector for a little while and look at it. Um, not necessarily objective. I don't know if it's possible to ever be objective. And I certainly think in, 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 in my story, it's, it's the father who expects the son to fit into a system, which is a socially accepted system, whether it's mediated by technology or not. We've always, we've always got humans want a place for everything and everything in its place, and that includes ourselves. 
And um, I think our three stories deal with ways of reaching beyond what's expected of us as being part of a system. Mm. And sometimes the, the dire consequences are trying for that and sometimes more optimistic consequences. Right, right. I do think Simon's touched on something like supremely fascinating about fiction in itself when we talk about like technology, like in terms of like magnitude and direction. Like I think essentially, technology and innovation tends to be a very scalar quantity. Like we always told about the magnitude of what's going to happen, how important it is, how great it is, how new it is. And it's almost left to like people like writers of science fiction to interpret the direction it's going to take us. So they actually assign, mm -hmm. they're basically making the scalar quantity into a vector quantity for us. And mm -hmm. I think it provides a lot of value in that sense. So I actually thought what he said was fantastic. Thank you. Uh, the, the scary thing about technology is that you've been looking at it and suddenly something slaps you from behind. And mushes by you, and you realize, oh, I didn't see that. Yeah, that's I one. I think the other thing that I think shift just build on what you just said. I think that other thing fiction does. It, you know, it, it, you talked about magnitude. That's how we often talk about like how many billion people are on Facebook or have cell phones or whatever. But the 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 individual human experiences are individual, right? And I think that's what fiction does. Is I think all three stories do is place the, the human and the individuals in that larger structure and how they respond to it becomes a way for us to sort of think through these consequences. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you guys have any thoughts on that. <laughs> okay, I, I, so Lee, there was a quest, there was a statement in your story which really stuck with me. And so I'm gonna put that statement there and have each of you respond to that. And this connects with this previous part about technology and you know, so on. And the, quest, the statement was something like, are you going to be okay if it is not what you thought? Mm -hmm. So I'm gonna repeat that because this might not have stood out for Simon, you and Shiv, but are you going to be okay if it is not what you thought? And I just, that sentence, I just kept going back to that sentence because I thought it does that not capture really something special about this relationship that we have with technology, right? I mean, there is always this sort of, this tool or technology will solve X problem. And are we gonna be okay? Or are you as an individual gonna be okay if it is not what you thought? And I would just love to hear, start with you, Lee, maybe, and then hear Shiv and Simon's uh, thoughts on that statement. Um, well, I think it follows on. Did you say me first or Lee first? Sorry. No, Lee, sorry. Sorry. No, no worries, thank you. No, I, I'll, I'll be quick. I think this just follows on what you were saying earlier about narrativization and, and you know, the role of storytelling in, in science fiction. Um, a lot of, you know, I'm very interested in this question of, you know, our, our expectation and our dream versus the reality, because, you know, we, a lot of us have lived long enough to see visions of the future change rapidly in our lifetime. So, you know, we're now in the world where we have a computer in our hand all the time, you know, the stuff that we were told about when, when a lot of the stuff that we were told about as children, you know, in a lot of parts of the world is here. And, you know, there's, there's, a, there's been, you know, a lot of social and you know, a lot of all manner of consequences and impact, both good and bad of this technology. And I, you know, it's, you know, was this what you wanted, I think is a powerful question for the digital age. And I think um, it also applies to disorientation. Like if it's not what you thought that, you know, the, the difference between the reality and the projection, um, I think we're using internet, we're using digital society in a hyper real way. Um, you know, we're constructing these sort of hyper authentic versions of ourselves or of the news or of the world in, in virtual space. And, and I think the gap between, you know, you know the, the medium is increasing the gap between ourselves and our conceptualization of these things. So yeah, like, it not being what you thought is, yeah, th thank you for, for um, uh, noticing that. Simon? I, th I think new technology always takes us by surprise and how it's adapted by people who wasn't necessarily created. I, and then this goes back to something like printing where, where people in authority thought printing was great. They could put out rules and regulations and you know, authorized Bibles and all that sort of stuff. But then people got hold of the printing press and put out a whole lot of other stuff, which they weren't expecting to see. And everyone was kind of surprised it happens. And every time we come with a new technology, we're constantly surprised when someone comes up with a new way of using it in a way we didn't expect or a way we don't like or a way that we do like, but never foresaw. And I, I don't think that's going to change. I think it's especially applicable to communication technology and information technology where, I mean, the, the computers are invented to help uh, a lot of money was put into computers in the 40s to help determine ballistics for artillery during the war. But here we are using computers to talk to each other across two continents 
uh, vast oceans, but about, about dramatically different ideas about how humanity interacts with technology and, and, and people are listening and, and forming opinions and so on. I don't think the people who originally came up with the idea of the computer had any idea that anything like this would be possible because of what they'd um, invented and, and, and explored. Thank you. Um, Shiv? Yeah, I think, so this is actually a really complex question which you very cleverly posed as like a one-liner. I see you, Punya, but there's a lot to this, really, I think. And like the core of the question in terms of like, it's also about like the clue is on the tin, right? Like we know technology isn't going to be as advertised or as we envisage it because various humans are going to have access to it at various points of time. Social media is obviously like the easiest example, right? Like it was supposed to be a way for me to like get cat pictures from my grandmother and like keep in touch with that one guy from high school who I really had a great, great conversation with once once upon a time in 1998. And today it's like deciding like entire political regimes and it's changing governments. And I don't think anybody ever envisaged it becoming something of this sort, right? And at a much more simplistic, individualistic level, I don't know if humans are actually equipped to deal with technology as just technology. Like we tend to anthropomorphize everything. And like a quick head count is actually very instructive. Think of how many people you know who have a Roomba who have given it a name like Sam or Bob or Mahesh or whatever. Very few people name their Roomba cleaning device machine. Very few people name their Wi-Fi Wi-Fi. You know, like we tend to like ascribe like humanistic values into every bit of technology we create or use. And then we're surprised when other people humanize them in different ways. So it's a bit of a wibbly wobbly complex thing, isn't it? I love that. I love that. You know, my Wi-Fi is life is beautiful, by the way, See? just in case. <laughs> and I spend a lot of time thinking of what it should be. So um, in fact, early on, I had done some research on how people, I mean, looking at children playing with anthropomorphic, uh, like these robotic dogs that Sony used to have, Ibo. And it's fascinating when they play with uh, like a just a stuffed animal dog, they will toss it around. But the moment this Ibo would show up, they would drop on their knees, make eye contact with this little robot. It's fascinating how, like, absolutely, as you said, they treated it as an intentional agent. You know, psychologically, it was psychologically real to them, even though it was, you know, and if you ask them, they say, oh, no, no, it's just a robot. Uh, but our instinctual reactions would be very different uh, in that space. I want to build on something that Simon, you spoke about, and I think sort of Shiv uh, addressed as well. I mean, if you look at the printing press, I was, uh, Simon Johnson talks of this idea of the adjacent possible and that, you know, when technologies come about. So, uh, so the example he gives of print is that once print came along, lots of people suddenly realized that they had bad eyesight because you never had to peer at small print uh, in candlelight. And guess what? One of the biggest industries that emerged post Gutenberg was the, these are the first accoutrements apart from clothes that are always a part of our body now. I mean, we are all cyborgs in that sense. And that led to people playing with glass and mirrors and lenses. And that led to the microscope and the telescope. And suddenly you have a completely different universe that you're living in. And I think that's something that technology does, which is as like you said, uh, Shiv, it comes from people taking it and you know making meaning of it in their own ways, and you know and and those differences in meaning is I think what can cause conflict sometimes. I don't know if there's a question here. It was just a thought that <clears throat> something that struck me as I was you know reminded of, and would love to hear any thoughts that you have on uh, this. Uh, I think it's interesting that you brought up mirrors because I think that, you know, part of the reason that we're, you know, we get attracted to Ibo or inclined to protect a robot in a way that we might not with a stuffed animal is that I think these technology is a construction of ours in our image, you know what I mean? And we have an attachment to it that way. Um, you know, we can't help but subconsciously reflect ourselves in something that we've, in a system that we've constructed. Um, it must reflect our own interiority in some way. So, I mean, I think <laughs> you know, it's easy to see robots as alive as a, as a result. I don't know, I just thought there was a link between your, your yeah, two topics. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So uh, one of the themes that sort of this story set series started from was this thing that we have at the college, uh, an initiative called this idea of principled innovation. 
And basically that there are, I mean, ASU is known as being number one in innovation, but the question that we ask is just because we can, should we, this of course comes from Jurassic Park, right? And I wanna have each of you talk a little bit about some connections that you see around sort of ethical and moral dimensions that emerged in the stories. And if you can speak across the stories, that will be wonderful. And Shiv, I'll start with you. Uh, maybe start with your story and other connections that you see between the other two. And we'll just go around uh, that way. And feel free to interrupt and jump in if you have any comments that you want to share in between. Wait, can you clarify that once again? Like you sort of cut so, out. Oh, I'm sorry. Is this better? Yes. Okay. So uh, this idea of principled innovation that you know that when we are looking at technological innovation, there are ethical and moral decisions and consequences to our actions, and that we need to factor those in. And so I'd like you to speak to a to your story, but also to see any connections that you saw with the other two, and then we can go in a, a in a round robin around that. Well, in terms of ethical considerations, I think one thing that jumps out across stories and across the world generally is, and this is something that's a topic that's a little bit of like a pet peeve of mine or something that's very dear to my heart, which is the concept of short-term solutions versus long-term problems, which is something that we constantly see all the time, right? Like every single, even, so in my story, for instance, there were all these instances where you had like a department head who was playing along with this on the face of it ludicrous idea of having a robot or an AI teaching creative writing because in the short term she wanted to save her job. So that made sense for her to sit in those meetings. Now, usually when something like this comes up, it's because some person in like some budgetary department or whatever has come up with this idea because they are thinking about the fact that in six months from now, they have an appraisal. So this will look good for them. So all these so-called systemic, a lot of these so-called systemic innovations that are sold to us, like we don't tend to often go into the human behind the suggestion, which I think is very interesting because a lot of these solutions or so-called solutions are essentially designed to affect humans more than systems themselves. So when you're telling a college professor, now do your entire pedagogy sitting at home via a Zoom, like that professor has to change a lot of things to do that. And it's really easy for me as an administrator to say, we will be all online Zoom teaching, you know what? Because we are into innovation and digitizing and it's awesome. And I can go to my boss and be like, give me my 20% bonus for this. But that professor is gonna have 20% less sleep for the rest of the year. Those students may or may not have 20% more or less learning for the rest of the year. And basically like what I'm trying to get at in a very roundabout fashion. So this was the case in this story. In Simon's story, it was again, short-term thinking versus long-term objectives. So, I think the father is an extraordinarily fascinating character in Simon's story, even though he only appears like a couple of times, because he's almost like the voice of the general lay society and the societal pressures that are put upon people who are trying to do slightly different things. So at any point where a status quo or a generalized understanding of a topic was questioned, the main character's dad was there to be like, no, that's not how it works. Why are you thinking this way? And then he had to be put in his place, but your way doesn't really seem to be working, is it? Like you're sitting at home right now and all you're really doing is giving me lectures on my life. And then the dad would retreat into the background for a bit and then he'd come back again. So it was sort of that recurring thing. I think the void in Lee's story tends to play a bit of a role like that in terms of like that empty space where we don't really have answers and people are like filling whatever is most expedient at the point of time. I think the response essay went into it in some more detail. I don't know if you want to touch upon that yet. But on the whole, yeah, this is what I think about it. Thank you. Uh, please, Simon, anybody wants to go next? Well, <clears throat> so, yeah, I was thinking like, you know, on the question of innovation, you know, what, what is actually, you know, a, a new idea? What is a refinement of, of an existing idea? And what is a design evolution in the wrong direction? And I think all three of the stories ask that question. We have like a, we have a virtual curator, we have a, an AI educator, and then we have an AI translator or a virtual translator, you know what I mean? So I think, you know, this question of developing these interfaces, whom they serve and what kind of vocabulary populates them is germane to all three stories. Um, and, um, you know, we can see sort of the, the, the holes, the gaps in that understanding are sometimes made larger by what we call innovation. Um, you know, sort of, I think in, in my story, the character being unable to 
I mean, so when I wrote the story, the, the painting that's described in the story does exist, spoiler alert, it's, it is my favorite painting. And the scale of the painting is absolutely tremendous. It really does look like two different things um, depending on where you're standing in orientation to it. And that is something that just absolutely, it's a physicality that cannot be replicated by looking at a digital image. And the um, fact in the story whereby the character is stopped on the Metropolitan website from viewing it at a larger scale, that's taken from reality, right? Like as Shiv says, it's present fiction. Um, we're already, you know, in the name of innovation and curation and info sorting, you know, uh, starting to garden people away from things that they might want to access. And I think, um, yes, uh, we're, the void does sort of mean that that disconnect that's occurring between people and the things that they're they're trying to access. And I do think that theme is present in all three stories that that communication gap, you know, the authority, the authority, the authoritative parent, or even the lack of understanding between human and animal on what should be eaten. You know what I mean? Like, uh, yeah, that's what I think about it too. Thank you, Lee. Um, Simon? I, I think one of the strongest ethical or moral issues, and I think it comes stronger in, um, in Shiv's and Lee's story that it does in mind is that a lot of organizations and systems are focused on, on outcomes rather than, um, uh, for example, students or uh, the well being of, 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 the, of the human and non human components involved. Um, I, I think outcomes are important, but they should be used to refine the tools you use, for example, to teach students. Um, my wife is a teacher and she spent the best part of the last year teaching through Zoom. And as Shiva was, playing, was, was, was saying, it means that there's, a, there's a lot more effort and energy. The days are extraordinarily long during that year. Uh, but the other problem she pointed out is, uh, to me, is that the students themselves don't have access to each other the way they used to. My wife, for example, can't determine what their state of mind is from their body language, from who they're looking at, the way they're looking out the window, what they're doing with their hands, where they're sitting on the desk. And the students themselves can't interact with each other. They can't chat, flirt, talk, exchange impromptu ideas, all that human to human close up communication stuff, which humans thrive on, which was essential to our well being, I think, have been left aside by technology. By the, by, the, by the Zoom technology. But that's, at the same time, we needed it. The, the, the classes couldn't stop, the learning couldn't stop. But I think outcome became more important than the students themselves during that year in, in, in a very strange way and how the technology is applied. I know things will get better. I'm, I'm, I'm confident things will get better the way we use it and the way we interact. But if we use it instead of human contact, that is, we don't go back to classes when it's safe to do so because it's cheaper and easier and more efficient to just zoom. I think education will, 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 will fall into the abyss. Mm. Thank you, Simon, for that. I'm, and this came up, I think, Lee, in our conversation. So uh, growing up in India, I got a chance to uh, see Rodin's sculptures. They, were, they had a traveling exhibition. And to go see the thinker, I'm saying, and Rodin used to do one thing in his sculptures, he either make them more than life-size or slightly less than life-size. So when you see them, you have this sort of odd, which you never get from seeing a picture, right? that the ratio, you know, and the thinker turned out to be much smaller than I thought it was. Plus, I had never thought that when I walk around it, I can see Rodan's butt. I mean, the thinker's butt. And that's a different way of getting a 360 view. Uh, it's real in some ways that, that you can never get from reading a critical analysis of the sculpture or seeing all these photographs of it, or even a virtual reality 360. There is something to be said for the for the being there experience in that museum around, surrounded by all his other pieces of art, you know? Um, so I just thought I would share that. I thought that was, it's a sort of a point. I think it's sort of funny, but also I think makes a broader point. Uh, we have a question from the audience that I'd like to bring up because I think it connects. Uh, so Ruth Shimal asks, uh, she wonders whether you think all uh, about how technology fills space to obviate boredom and distract from dealing with meaning and emotion, fear and anxiety. And then she says that these stories are so much closer in that regard. And um, I think I'm going to start with you, Lee, because I think uh, that sort of is a theme that is really powerful. But I think it is touched upon uh, in each of those. Like, Shiv, all, all your interactions happen through a screen. Simon, I think the tension between the parent and the child, all of those, right? So maybe, uh, Lee, start with you. Well, I just like as as a point of clarification, I feel like probably every era in time would have 
some threat to intimacy posed by communication. When we talk about it, like, oh, we can't touch and everything being coded, like that's how the Victorians lived and somehow they managed to meet and marry and have intimacy. You know what I mean? Like you know, th there's been several iterations of human communication where intimacy has been threatened. Um, so, you know, I, I don't want to sound like, you know, I'm anti, you know, social media in that way. However, I think there is definitely, you know, an, a new set of challenges to intimacy and communication um, that, that come with this. Um, and and yes, this uh, this definitely, I think the pandemic highlighted for a lot of people um, ways in which their digital relationships were like lozenges and ways they were mediating boredom or unpleasant feelings by sort of flicking thumbing the rosary of the phone screen and like um <clears throat> i just feel like it's it's exception i think we are in the process of adjusting exceptionally as a society to uh, a lot of we have more exposure to each other than we've ever had you know i think we are processing more connections to one another than we've ever had to even as we have less physical intimacy and things like that um so i do think that there's an anxiety and that there's a sense of coping um i do think that people are trying increasingly to use digital culture um in a dopaminergic way like whether that's asmr or you know soothing audio lo-fi beats or um you know communities around like i follow you know so many different twitter feeds that are just devoted to liminal spaces like you know empty playgrounds or like waiting rooms and hallways and like old communal old civic buildings like the type of things you don't see anymore because mm -hmm. i live in the city and spend all my time online now you know so i i don't know i think a, there's this nostalgia for texture um oh. you know and, and is that negative coping or is that sort of is that a holistic is is are we transposing our senses you know into into the digital space that we're you know that we're spending so much time you know uh attached to and maybe it's not an either or right i mean maybe it's part of being human being living in these times is finding what works you know you know for you uh, simon Shiv, either if you want to uh, follow up on that well i think one of the things technology has done i'm not the first to point this out is that it it, it stops our children from being bored um when I was a kid and I got bored, I got up and found things to do. I discovered new ways to play or went out and saw the world a bit or contacted friends or found my parents or did a job. But it seems to me that a lot of young people these days have easy access to entertainment. They can find themselves playing a computer game or being online with friends and social media without moving. Um, I'm not talking about the physical thing about ex moving and exercises. So that's not the point. The point is... I think being bored is a good driver for creativity. It allows you to explore the world or forces you to explore the world in a way that you wouldn't normally do. Um, finding something to do, finding something to occupy your mind, finding something to occupy your hands. Uh, the, the, the oldest piece of artwork that humans created isn't actually created by our species. It was created by Homo erectus. It's a bit of, it's, it's a series of chevrons on the seashore. And, you can, and it was found in a midden. So you just imagine this, this, this cousin of ours sitting on a pile that bored out of its mind, not knowing what to do, waiting for the seashells to quit, picking one up and just etching on it, you know, something to do. And um, who knows, it may, have been the very, it may have been the very first piece of writing or calligraphy or artwork um, in, in hominin history. So I think, I think sometimes new technology takes that away that from us, that opportunity to, to, to be bored and discover ways of doing new things. Perfect. Uh, Shiv, your thoughts, and then we've started getting quite a few questions on the chat, but I want to address one thing before we go there. So quickly, your thoughts before we uh, shift gears a little bit. I do think it's important to note at this point that like this particular question is not in any sense a new question. Like back in the day, and we've, and Simon mentioned the Gutenberg printing press, when they first started printing newspapers, there was something, I forget the name, but I think there was something along the order of the good good manners or something like that they call themselves society that actively campaigned against newspapers because they said people reading newspapers in public was causing lack of social interaction which is the exact same thing that is happening with social media today right you have people complaining oh everyone's looking at their phone but it's it's not a new argument it's just a new well product which is being argued against in that sense right and as far as innovation goes like i think lee story has one very fantastic little moment there where she mentions vanta black 
And Vanta Black is extraordinarily interesting in this context because it's a new technology or a blackest black, so to speak. And one of the first things that happened when it came out was an artist from the UK tried to patent it for himself. So nobody else could use it. <laughs> and I think that just kind of sums up the whole thing. <laughs> So that is a question. I bet could manage to use the newspaper to print the manifesto. <laughs> um, there's a question around economics that's coming up from one of our listener viewers. But um, I do want to take a little sidetrack here because I think one of the things that these three stories do, and the fact that you know that Shiv, you're from India, sitting in Seattle. Simon, you're from Australia, uh, sitting in South Africa. I'm from India, sitting in Phoenix. Lee, you are in London right now from the US. I mean, <laughs> right? Um, yeah. So, and I think that all of these stories have this other thing in common. And I think that that's, maybe that's a theme that you guys are deliberately doing, which is to sort of widen the range of voices and characters that exist in this space. And I know we have talked about it individually in our webinars. And Simon, you've taken it one more level by going intraspecies, right? Or interspecies uh, in that. And so I'm wondering if that, how much of that is something that you think is a part of how you work, um, that you think about your creative work with that sort of in the back of your mind. Um, I'll start with you, Shiv. Well, I do think about it in the sense that I do think a lot of science fiction, especially historically, has tended to get a little siloed where, you know, standard fantasy world, like you shut your eyes, you will imagine one kind of fantasy world, which is basically the Tolkien ripoff of like this idealized version of you of Europe, which doesn't actually have brown people. So it is not like Europe, actually, in fact, but it somehow exists in these fantasy worlds. And in a larger context, I think like as the world globalizes, as we all get drawn, like as you said, each of us is effectively someone who was born somewhere and is currently sitting somewhere else on in a completely different country. So the world is very global at this point of time. Like there's a lot more stuff that we can find that is in common, which does not have to like point to specifics like race. And when I say specifics like race, I mean like we don't really have to restrict it to one particular race, one particular geography, one particular anything, because the things that unite humans are so much more universal. And it just seems like a much more powerful wellspring of story to draw on when we can draw on things that sort of like connect us all across geographies as a species, rather than pointing to specific places and times and saying, this is where a cool thing happened. Thank you, um, Simon. No, I agree completely with Shiv. I think that diversity is one of the main drivers of creativity. Um, the things that we learn from uh, people we come across from different cultures and backgrounds and stuff, it just contributes so much to a, the way we, it opens our eyes to what, what's possible in the world. And we can, we, we, we can adapt it and use it and then send it back again. You know, that culture isn't, can't be boxed. A culture just flows and, and I think diversity is, 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 is essential for culture to grow and to find new directions. And uh, without it, I think we, we become very stale very quickly uh, and we get lost. Mm. Lee, I know we have talked about this other, not this story, but another story of yours that sort of uh, deeply resonated with me because it allowed me to see a perspective in a very powerful way uh, that I wouldn't have otherwise. And so, can you speak a little bit to this issue, you know, that we are talking about now about bringing different voices and the power and the need for that? Yeah, um, I think generally um, there was this promise made by the technology industry that was very utopian. You know, we're supposed there's supposed to be this great, you know, the internet as this great equalizer and a tool as being completely agnostic of class or creed and all of these things. And obviously, I think under like, you know, white supremacist capitalist, like Western heteropatriarchy, that, you know, hasn't been the case. The technology industry is controlled by a very narrow range of voices. And therefore, you know, the product and vision are a narrow range of product and vision. And then at least over my lifetime, at least, there's been this, you know, sort of circle yank between the fiction that gets created about the technology industry and the products that it makes so that they're just trying to bring Ready Player One and Snow Crash to life. You know what I mean? Like they read the books, they work in the tech industry and, you know, there's this weird sort of oddly out of touch optimistic boy hero loop that I'm sort of trying to, to consciously break, um, you know, by systematically biasing my work toward marginalized people um, because, you know, 
again, this comes back to the theme that we keep have we uh, keep discussing as a group that you know the impacts of ecosystems are, are felt in intimate life, and you know the in, the impact of ecosystems is felt most acutely in intimate life from people that are not you know part of this you know. Silicon Valley centric, you know, global utopian techno capitalist, you know, vision, which is almost everybody is marginalized by that. And, um, you know, I personally want to focus specifically on, you know, women struggling under these conditions, um, you know, you know, people with particular identity concerns and, uh, around self representation in, in, in digital space, because, you know, we've understood that the technology environment is a more hostile and toxic place for some people than for others, and it is po more possible for some voices to be su to succeed on social media than others, you know, race and race and and um, gender and all of these things play a role. And um, the technology, you know, I've experienced firsthand in my journalism career, how disinterested the technology industry is in solving those problems and in unbiasing those data sets and in decreasing, you know, the impact on, on, on people. So, you know, if through fiction, I can sort of tell stories that, you know, diversify the range of voices in, in, in futurism, um, you know, that's something that's really important to me. And, and I think everyone, uh, the, the other authors would share, share that view as well. No, I mean, I have to say that of the three webinars that they did, the only one that got hacked was the one, Lee, that you were uh, the guest <laughs> on, right? And it, it really stayed with me. It's like, no, I know, I mean, that, and that is not a coincidence, right? I mean, and uh, got Zoom bombed. And to have to live through that kind of a, a world, um, really, I mean, it's essential that these different voices be brought in and be centered. And so thank you for the work that you do in that. And it just, that whole incident just brought it home to me in a very palpable way, because I don't get that, honestly, That's right? Very, I that was very unremarkable to me. I, I didn't, no, I, I, no. I could not even assume that was particularly to do with me. <laughs> you know, it's just um, not to draw attention, but yeah. The, and and the, the, these are things that time and again, like, you know, the leaders of the industry do not consider those experiences when they're doing product design and, and you know, the further out you go from the concerns of, of privileged users of technology, the more interesting these ecosystemic impacts, be, the more the more complicated problems they become to solve. And, and I think more interesting problems to solve than fulfilling like yet another, you know, Christmas toy power fantasy for who, you know, whoever on the West Coast, you know. <laughs> so um, there's a- important to also ahead. put in at this point that when we're talking about like diversifying storytelling, it affects a lot more than simply characters, even though that's a really important aspect. Like it affects how stories are told in themselves and how they are received. For instance, mm. a lot of storytelling across the world does not follow the Campbellian three act structure. Like it does not follow these so-called norms and procedures of show, don't tell, blah, blah, blah. Like there are, in fact, if show, don't tell was a thing, we wouldn't have oral storytelling because it's all telling, which is essentially the most primal form of storytelling, right? So the more, people and ideas we include within our storytelling across the world, like the more everyone, essentially, I, I don't understand an argument that more diversity can ever be a negative. Like how can it be bad to have more kinds of stories to read and more kinds of people to read about? There doesn't seem to be a context in which it's bad. So uh, there's a question which is sort of related from Michael uh, on Zoom. Uh, which uh, speaks to, again, expands this thing a little further is that is there regarding digital communication and spaces that still seem inaccessible to the disability community in your mind, anyone can answer if com comfortable and says as a clarification that uh, that they are autistic. And I was wondering if people had any thoughts about that. Anybody can jump into that. So I have ADHD, a fairly chronic version of it. And I think it's very interesting what has happened over the last year. Like for years and years and years, we've heard that certain kinds of accessibility methods cannot be implemented. They're too difficult. It's impossible. We can't do it. We don't have the money. We don't have the technology. We don't have the base. And in about like two and a half months flat in 2020, we did it just because everybody needed it when it, the bottom line depended on it. So what that tells me is that these problems aren't really as big as, the problem is not so much one of execution, it's one of will. And I think in terms of like, disabled activists and disability activists and uh, people with disabilities across the world at this point have got like every last bit of ammo they need to make this argument at this point. Like we just did it. And now we're actually having conversations about undoing it because you know what the bottom line might get affected. Uh -huh. So 
what you're basically telling people from the community is you're not worth it in literal terms. We are putting a money valuation on it and you're not worth it. And I really think that's something that we all need to like take a minute to think about like every time we have this conversation about the message that goes out through this conversation. Thank you. I have ADHD Anybody? as well. So it's been like very hard not to interrupt and say, yeah, I totally, <laughs> I totally, no, I totally understand what you're talking about. Remote work has been a real blessing for me. It's allowed me to accomplish a lot more. Um, but, you know, again, as Shiv said before, we're told it's not possible until there's a financial incentive. In some cases, you can make the financial case to companies and they will still decline because they're so uncomfortable with it culturally. You know, I've tried to pitch, pro you know, trying to pitch diverse projects in the technology industry, whether that is a tool or an entertainment product, is still an uphill battle. Like going to social media companies and saying, look, here is a, a financial and a statistical and data argument for you to increase, you know, I don't know, safety and moderation individual tools for users or for you to take women's privacy seriously or, you know, for you to have a different policy on, you know, this or that, you know, and, and they, they just don't want to do it because it's a culture, it represents to them a cultural shift. They have given away too large of a philosophical share of what they're doing, I think. And, and um, you know, sometimes not even money will incentivize them to care about accessibility because they don't, they, it's so important for that to them that you suffer. You know, suffering is so important to their understanding to the world of the world, you know? I, I think, I think there's a, there's a very good analogy that with the health system in some countries where like countries that have a health system that works um, spend less money than countries with health systems that don't on health and their health outcomes are better. So it, it makes no financial sense not to have universal health care. There's not one single good economic or human reason not to do it. But as, as, as other people have pointed out before me, there's someone holding an irrational position, no amount of rational argument is going to shift them. Yeah, and as you pointed out, Lee, it, it's, it's, they caught in it. My favorite example of this entire thing of this part of the conversation is the employers who are like, you work on spreadsheets. That's your job. I now require to come to this physical location and work on that spreadsheet because I will not let you work from home. It will save us money. It will save you money. But no, you must come here. <laughs> they want to control you. It's because the environment of monitoring your physical body is crucial to their notion of capital. Like it's, it's yeah, it's it's. So when you, when you this, teach them for what they're clinging to, it's never, it's always really, really loathsome. Yeah. Yeah. So this is the problem having three people with ADHD and poor Simon <laughs> who just gets outshouted by all of us. <laughs> no. So this connects actually to a question from Joey uh, on the, uh, on Zoom. And, and uh, Joey, as is a good friend of the show. In fact, he works for Center for Science and the Imagination and I think worked with all of you as well. So he says, all of the stories engage with how technology transforms economics. Lee's story deals with systemic precarity in the workforce, the impact of austerity, and the informalization of academic work. Shiv uh, deals with the corporatization of education and tension between budgets, profits, and learning. And Simon, with his acknowledgement of non-human sentience, suggests huge legal and thus economic consequences for interspecies interchange. So his question is, how do the authors think about the economics of education and learning as these industries will shape the future? So anybody wants to jump in first, and we'll just go from there. I love this question because it brings us to the whole idea of learning, which is the broader theme and sort of as we are getting to the end. So, um, so the question of how does economics of education and learning change as these technologies enter into our worlds? I can't help but being an optimist and, and it's probably foolish considering what's happened over the last year, but that technology will make education more accessible for more people and for, and for less money. Um, where the money can be spent, hopefully, uh, somewhere else in education to improve um, the lives for these students. And it's especially in, in, in countries like, um, in continents like Africa, in countries like South Africa, Botswana, Zimbabwe, Zambia, where they, they desperately want as much education as they can. <laughs> they desperately want to be at school and they desperately want to go to university. And they desperately want to make the best they can of their lives. Um, and education is a fundamental part of that. If technology can help them achieve it, that's fantastic. So I think we, we shouldn't throw technology, we shouldn't be down on technology because of the obvious um, uh, problems with it. But there's so much potential, so much that can be done. 
but the, the, the problems just seem so intrinsic. Every time we have a new technology, there seems to be um, the, the systems in place seem to take it, that we're reluctant to use it to begin with and then take it and take it from us. And, and, and I don't know how you overcome that. But I think one thing all these three stories do, and I think they all make it fairly clear that they're doing it, is that there's this distinction between technology and users of technology. And I think a lot of us tend to blame technology for problems that stem from users and creators of technology. And mm. it's been that way forever, right? Like from the time of the Skynet stories onward, Skynet is evil. Like nobody ever thinks to ask about the dude who built Skynet. Mm. So, that's one aspect of it. The other aspect of it is in terms, I think it's a definitional problem when you talk about value because like, okay, so take my story. You have like a university. On the one hand, you have a teacher who's saying, I decide what is value based on, like the student learning and leaving this place more knowledgeable than they came in is value addition for me. On the other hand, on the other side of the building, you've got someone sitting with a spreadsheet saying, as long as we are spending less money on each student than we are earning from them, that is value. And like, as long as these two definitions and the various other ones continue to clash, and we don't really have a universal definition of value addition within education, we're going to continue to come back to this economic problem of choice, which is how they tend to describe all economics, don't they? Lee? Um, yeah, I think it, I don't find it pessimistic to be systems critical. You know, we can be, you know, optimistic mm -hmm. about potential, but, you know, needs to come with a close observation to, um, you know, that structural element that might cause it to just reproduce the same problems. Um, you know, in unless you correct for the bias, it will reproduce the same problems. So I think for me, the experience of um, people that I know that work in education right now is very stressful as a result of this transforming landscape and the desire, the need, the important desire to make technology more accessible. You know, it is it's coming at a cost. You know, I know teachers who work incredible hours and and you know maybe don't have the most sustainable living situations, and um, you know if we're making education more remote, you know, where is it intersecting? You know, I wanted to ask in my piece where it intersects with existing care and collaboration jobs. Mm -hmm. um, you know, in, in my story shows a teacher who's student, who's, who's kind of bearing an, an, an inappropriate degree of emotional responsibility for her students' well-being. Cause I think, you know, those lines are becoming, you know, more blurred when, when we make, you know, so accessibility for learning is great, but you know, how are we going to make that viable for the people who are working in the system? You know, how are we going to, you know, how 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 are how is education going to be adequately supported in a system where it's transforming? And if we don't look at um, you know if we don't look at this as a problem solving thing rather than as a blue sky thing, we might end up um, increasing the squeeze on on our teachers and things like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, once uh, when the pandemic started, I wrote a piece uh, of value of school, and you know we tend to think of schools as being places for academic learning. And I just made a whole case for all the different things that schools do. And, and the fundamental economic argument is at the heart is schools keep our like babysitters for our children so that we can go and run the economy. You know, <laughs> the, the push for like, let's open schools now, let's open schools now, doesn't come from any deep interest in the learner or the student. It comes mm -hmm. from, we need to get people back to work. I mean, again, I mean, I'm, this is not a judgment call one way or the other, but I think it's interesting, but I think it's important that we face that economic uh, sort of reality of the situation. I'm looking at the time, we are at one minute. So I think this is great to have wound it up around this issue of learning. I'm sorry to Tony, Tony had a question about how learning could be transformed in this space, which I would love to have asked, but I need to keep to the time. So Lee, Shiv, Simon, thank you so much for joining uh, once again and for the pieces that you wrote. I have to give a special thanks to our three academic experts who wrote the response pieces, Iveta Silova, Andrea Thomer, and Katina Michael. Um, we had three wonderful conversations with them and the individual authors. All of those are archived at the Learning Futures education.asu website. A big thank you to all of those who participated, uh, who watched and sent in their questions. Apologies to those whose questions are, we could not get to. I also wanna be sure to thank all the people who made this series and event possible. First, thanks to the Future Tense team, including the folks at Slate, ASU Center for Science and the Imagination um, for working with us. And thanks to the Principal Innovation Team, Marketing and Event Team at MLFTC, uh, the people at the Office of Scholarship and Innovation. This has been so much fun. 
thank you so much. You can reach out to me, email, Twitter, uh, or go to uh, learningfutures.education.asu.edu, which has all the stories and everything, uh, all the different webinars, all archived on one page. And finally, I have to make a plug for next week, uh, Future Tense event on April 22nd. This is the launch of Patrick Radin Keep's book, Empire of Pain. I just read a review of it yesterday in the New York Times. It seems like a fascinating book, uh, really getting into something sort of that has really, I think, uh, transformed our country, at least America, in terms of the uh, you know, drug problem and so on. And so I think it'll be a great event. So thank you again, everybody. This was great. Thank you, Lee, Shiv, Simon. Um, this has been the high point of my last uh, few months. So I'm sorry to see it go, but I'm also glad that we got a chance to do this. <laughs> thank you for doing this, Punya. Yes, thank you all. It's, it's, been, a, it's been a blast. I've really enjoyed it. Great. We'll Absolutely. find some other opportunities to continue. Thank yeah. you. Absolutely. Thank you, guys.